I'd like to mention that uh, we've been doing this work uh, with AOML and Frank Marx's group for quite a while. Um, a lot of the uh, work uh, is directly relevant to NOAA's mission on improving hurricane forecasts. Uh, but we've been looking at the upper ocean and its response to the strong forcing for a number of storms over the past two to two and a half decades. Today, I'm, I really want to talk to you about what's happened over the past decade with respect to some recent storms. And I'm going to acknowledge a lot of my students. I've, I've taken their work, so uh, I'm, I'm a messenger, uh, but there's a lot of uh, references throughout, and so you can actually go to the peer-reviewed literature and read about what they've actually done. And you know, you know these three organizations. Maybe you don't know MMS. Minerals Management Service is part of the Department of Interior. These are the folks that are responsible for issuing leases to oil companies so they can drill in places like the Gulf of Mexico. And we're going to focus in on the Gulf of Mexico because traditionally you get very strong storms there. So I'll motivate it, response features, OHC that you've heard repeatedly, the loop current warm core eddy interactions with deep ocean mix layers, Isidore and Lilly, Katrina and Rita, Gustav and Ike in 2008. There's cold core eddies and some modeling work that I'm doing with George Hallowell. Uh, through JHT, and our program uh, this summer working with through IFEX and MMS as well as GRIP. The recurrent theme in our work is the fact that uh, one dimensionality doesn't usually work around strong fronts. Uh, I understand you do it for simplicity and trying to get an ocean in your model, but in places like loop currents, warm core eddies, Gulf streams, one dimensionality flow characteristics just do not work. Okay, motivation. This is why we do what we do. This is from uh, Minerals Management Service. These are the, this is the path of Katrina and Rita in 2005. These are all the oil rigs out there in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So you have to understand the upper ocean response and the forces that the strong winds, waves, and currents uh, push on these structures because during this period of time, they lost about 40% of their oil rigs. So what's the point? We often feel pain at the pump when we lose a lot of oil rigs out here in the Gulf of Mexico. So it really hits home, it hits your wallet. So really understanding the ocean response characteristics and its relationship to intensity and intensity and structure change is really important. So uh, the Gulf of Mexico is a really interesting place. Loop current gets formed through, the, this is the Yucatan Straits, and as it moves north over a cycle of about 6 to 11 months, it'll spin off a big warm core ring. These warm core rings actually move west to southwest about as fast as your grass grows, uh, a few kilometers per day. Uh, so they, they are, at any, at any given time, you'll have three to four of these puppies in the Gulf of Mexico. And chances are, during the summer months, a storm is going to interact with them. Uh, so the loop current flows around uh, in an anticyclonic or clockwise fashion, goes through the Florida Straits, and spins off these eddies every so often. This is actually the altimetry from uh, Katrina and Rita, or pre-Katrina and Rita. So what we did is, this is the ocean heat content product. If you actually look at a, an SST image, it's basically flat. It's like a big warm bathtub, and the in the, in the summer months. If you ever get to the Gulf of Mexico during the summer months, very high heat content water and very warm. It's, it's like a bath. But what we actually look at here is the upper ocean heat content actually in mapping out the isotherm structure from radar altimeters. Radar altimeters give you either a, a trough or a ridge on the free surface that basically tell you how deep the warm water goes or how shallow the cold water is. It's relatively Straightforward physics, this is a warm core ring, loop current, and then this is, the, as the loop current escapes through the uh, Florida Straits, it actually uh, turns into the Florida current that is, uh, actually represents the core of the Gulf Stream as we move northward. So the fundamental question is, is SST really enough for intensity change, and is SST really a good indicator of the amount of response that's actually going on underneath the storm? And, in, and of course, in 2005, we had the trifecta. Katrina reached 896 millibars, Rita 892, 
and then 882 millibars for Wilma down in this area. Keep in mind, Wilma rapidly intensified at the same position as Gilbert did in 1988. So some of the basic characteristics of an ocean response, upwelling along the track, if you think about this as a thermocline, upwelling along the track and out at about one to two radii of maximum winds, you get currents that are generated by the uh, winds. They turn clockwise with depth, often indicating that there's rapid energy transfer going from the wind force mix layer, depicted here by H, into the thermocline and below. But what it does generate are, are episodes of mixing through shear and shear instability that the 1D models capture. But the argument is that if you're actually around strong frontal boundaries, this 1D approach doesn't necessarily work quite well. And you heard yesterday about Rick Anthes talking about ocean heat content. Well, this, this all dates back to work by uh, Pearl Roth, Fisher, Paul Main, followed by Leeper and Volganu, as well as O'Brien back in the 70s. And now what we do is we actually use satellite altimetry to map out regions of high and low ocean heat content. And this is actually what one of these spirals look like when you're looking at wind forced inertial motions getting from the wind force mix layer and into the thermocline. Phase is upward, vertical energy propagation is downward. So the difference between a cold core eddy and a warm core eddy. Six kilojoules per square centimeter in a cold core eddy. This is from an XBT, uh, and this is from an XBT in a, in a warm core eddy. Notice it's an order of magnitude, two, almost two orders of magnitude difference between the two in terms of ocean heat content. So the fundamental question is, how much heat content does a storm need? Leeper estimated that for a, for a storm, it needed about 16 kilojoules per square centimeter. Well, in a warm core ring, you have an order of magnitude more. So there's a, basically an infinite heat source. Very deep warm layers, deep mixed layers, that uh, the 26 degree isotherm usually gets down to about 120 to 150 meters in the loop current in the warm core rings. How do we do altimetry? We take three or four altimeters, put them through an objective mapping technique, and every day when new tracks come in, we update this, this map. So the surface height anomaly field from the altimeter is an indication of whether or not there's a warm or cold feature. And you can see this is the bar uh, that shows what the recent satellites are that we're using. Right now we're using Jason, Jason 2, and NVSAT. So they've been around since 1982. And here's an example of Katrina and Rita. We were actually had to go back and reprocess the, the satellite data because there was problems with the GFO during that period of time. And then we just added the mean by the Aviso group and then to make a comparison because one of the comments on our paper was, we don't, we don't believe your radar altimetry. Well, we put this in here. We added our surface height anomaly field to their mean condition and, and got their uh, surface height anomaly field plus their mean. And you can see the correlation between the two. Uh, and here's a regression. Here's the probability density function. And basically, slopes are order one. And the correlation coefficients here were about 0.95. So how do we do it? We figure out the surface height anomaly. We take the surface height anomaly field, run it through a simple reduced gravity model. Uh, using the climatology of the day. Uh, we blend and objectively map those data. We infer the depth of the 20, and then we estimate the depth of the tw 26 via a ratio based on mean climatologies, either daily, monthly, seasonally, or annually. And then we estimate OHC relative to this, uh, to the uh, 26 degree water. And here's sort of the proof of the pudding where we took about 10,000 observations in the Eastern Pacific and made a comparison. Here's the regression in the PDF again. But this is, a, this is a transect that was revisited about five times along this uh, section here that uh, they, go they, they make XBT transects when they go out and do maintenance on the towel moorings in the, east, in, in the equatorial wave guide. So here's the, the blue line X, re represents the XBT average. The black line represents the satellite average over the same period of time. And you can see there's a very good correlation. And you can see the error bars uh, suggest that uh, what we're getting from space is fairly realistic. These dots represent estimates from moorings. 
Isidore and Lily. Uh, this is how we spent our 2002 vac uh, summer vacation. Uh, basically, we did pre-grids pre before Isidore. Uh, during Isidore, uh, we did uh, dual aircraft experiments with NOAA HRD. And then uh, we went out and did a wake experiment. How we do these experiments is we measure what's there before, measure what's there during, and then measure what's there after. So we really understand how much heat is being lost due to entrainment heat flux, as well as a surface heat flux. So for Isidore, what, what we basically saw through the through this uh, Yucatan Straits here is about a one degree change. Strong current advecting the isotherms into the Gulf of Mexico and a large amount of cooling up here in the shelf. This is the Yucatan shelf here that Isidore uh, uh, caused significant upwelling, upwelling of about four and a half to five degrees. Katrina and Rita, we were fortunate enough to get a couple flights. So our post-Katrina actually turned into pre-Rita, unknown to us at the time. I'd like to say that we actually predicted Rita's track well in advance, but my nose would start growing. And I wouldn't be telling you the truth, but we actually went out here and we dropped a bunch of drifting buoys uh, we dropped a bunch of AXBTs, AXCPs, and AXCTDs. There will be a, a quiz at the end with all these acronyms. Um, so we did this transect going through the eddy, and then uh, after Rita came through, we went out and revisited the same site. And basically what you saw, we, you saw uh, a cold core ring merge, uh, basically separate the loop current and the warm core eddy. That's associated with the dynamics of the shedding process associated with ring dynamics in the, in the loop current, as well as other places. Maximum cooling over here to the right of the track for Katrina, not a whole lot of cooling in the loop current. This, this depicts the, the, uh, the isotherm depth for the, for the actual loop current. And then for, for uh, Rita, you actually saw this cool spot associated with cold core eddy. So the proof in the pudding here is we also had a, more, a, a few MMS moorings out there where we had temperature, salinity, and currents uh, as a function of time. So Benjamin, as part of his thesis, actually did a cluster average of all the temperature changes in the loop current, one degree C, in the shedding front, or the cold core eddy, about four and a half to five degrees, and then in the actual warm core eddy itself, a temperature change of about a half a degree. The point is that the ocean doesn't significantly mix everywhere. You're not going to get a nice three-dimensional cold wake everywhere that, uh, in, in the world's oceans. You have fronts, eddies, strong currents, and strong boundaries that you can resolve with satellite remote sensing, as well as going out and making detailed measurements. This is from Gustav and Ike. And some of the work we're doing with George Hallowell uh, we're doing some work with HICOM, and uh, I want you to look at this picture where we were fortunate enough to actually uh, work with the Naval Research Lab. There were 15 moored ADCPs out there, upward looking, giving you currents, temperatures, as well as salinities as a function of time and depth. And Ivan went right over them, so they represent a nice challenge for HICOM. And so we did a 15 or 20 Numerical experiments, here's the observations. Basically what we're finding is the KPP scheme is far superior to, uh, uh, to the Mellor Yamada and the uh, other traditional mixing schemes. And this is what, how we're gonna spend 2010 summer vacation. Uh, these are all the new moorings that the MMS uh, folks have put out. There's roughly 40 to 50. It's in, it's in collaboration with the, the Mexican uh, scientists. They're also interested in what happens across the Yucatan Straits. And this whole program is based on looking at the physics of the loop current dynamics, or the loop current dynamics experiments. So what we're going to do is when a storm gets into the Gulf of Mexico, the idea is to do uh, a lot of sampling from the, from the P3 using CPs, CTDs, and BTs. So I'll leave it at that. But basically, when you, when you begin to uh, merge aircraft uh, surveys with mooring, drifter, float data, you really begin to get a clear understanding of what's going on 
in the ocean beneath the strong storms. Negative feedback is what we always hear, but there's always less negative feedback over places like the Gulf Stream and the Loop Current, and the SSTs are in fact modulated by these features. Thank you.